my name is Doug, and I'm a, a team member on, on, on the Google Brain team. And I'm going to talk to you about a project called Magenta that's focusing on a really hard challenge, which is generating music and art using deep learning. So why? Why are we here? Um, we're here to ask the question, can we use deep learning and reinforcement learning to generate compelling media? And treating that generally, we're talking about music and images and video and text, for example, joke telling. And uh, this is a hard problem. Uh, I'd missed the keynote this morning, but someone in the audience maybe still is working with ro robots and painting. Is that person still here? All right, so you know this is hard, right? This is not an easy thing just to generate. But furthermore, we want to generate things that are interesting and are surprising, and we want to measure success. So we want to understand what people are really doing with this media. And I think it's an exciting time to be able to try a project like this, where we have um, some of the tools available to us that weren't there before. And, um, and this is what we're about. So one of the things that we're trying to do is, is do this out in the open and do this uh, build a community. So a community of creative coders and a community of, of artists and musicians to work with us. So everything that we're doing in Magenta is being put into open source um, in, in GitHub in the TensorFlow repo. Uh, uh, get, or rather, Magenta repo and TensorFlow. And we're trying really hard to have tools, for example, um, Jupyter Notebooks, that allow people to really quickly do some things um, so that we can draw them in and, and, and we'll all work on this together. So this is an example of style transfer um, that's out there. But I think more to the point, and the, I think the challenge that, that I want people to leave with, in, if, if you're going to think about this problem, and I think it's a problem we're thinking about, a challenge, is, is understanding just how important it is for these models to be embedded in the world and to get critical feedback. As a thought experiment, you can imagine we train some model that can just generate you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of songs that sound just like the Beatles or whatever. You know. It's not very interesting to just think of pushing that button. right? You just keep generating more and more material, and it becomes overwhelming. I think more interesting is thinking about making a feedback loop where magenta is being used by musicians, being used by artists, in some interactive way, and also the stuff that's being generated is being evaluated by people. <clears throat> um, another way to look at this is with respect to kind of what we can do as engineers and, and what we can do as artists and musicians. Um, art, and, art and technology have always co-evolved, right? The, the film camera was initially thought of as, A, um, this, this device that is not artistic, and is, is, is there to just to capture reality, and be something that is kind of not very interesting compared to what painters are doing. And people came along and turned it into an artistic instrument. And you would note that when people turn things into artistic instruments, they tend to try to break them or to use them in ways in which they're not intended. So on the slide you're looking at now, on the left you'll see Les Paul. He's one of the inventors of the electric guitar. Rickenbacker is another. And um, what they were trying to do with the electric guitar was make it louder so that they could compete with other instruments in, in, in a concert setting. And they weren't trying to make it distort, right? And, and they weren't trying to, to, you know, distortion was a failure case, right? And you have people like uh, Jimi Hendrix above or St. Vincent on the bottom. They come along and they take this technology and, and they do things with it that are unexpected. And I think that's a, that's a really important part of the recipe. What makes, I think, Magenta interesting with respect to this, if, if you will, is to say, okay, what if we can make something like an electric guitar or like a drum machine, um, or like a camera, but that it itself has some, some, some machine learning intelligence. So it's pushing back a little bit. The idea that you might actually have something that you as an artist or a musician can push against, that listens to you, that responds to you. And the question then is, can we, the people on Magenta, probably more like Les Paul or Rickenbacker than, than like Jimi Hendrix. So I, I do play guitar and I, I am left-handed. So there's a little bit of Jimi Hendrix in me. Um, the, uh, the, the basic idea is can we as engineers build some technology and then create that loop of, uh, of collaboration with, um, with artists, right? Okay. So let's dive into a little bit of research now. Um, let's talk about uh, a nice problem, uh, image in painting. How many people in the room are familiar with this basic idea? Okay, quite a few. You, uh, it's interesting that you, know, you chop a chunk out of an image, and, and then you try to fill it back in. And it's a kind of generative problem, uh, except in, in one way it's easier than generating an image from whole cloth, because you don't have the surrounding context, yet it's also harder, because you have to obey the surrounding context. Um, this image is actually um, research from Pathnak, um, not from, from, from the Magenta team or Google Brain, but I thought it was a great image. Um, you see that the human artist on the upper right has filled in the the, the, the missing spot quite nicely. Um, probably those of you that have looked at the recent work in, in, in GANs, 
generative adversarial networks are aware of this finding that um, uh, a normal L2 loss will give rise to something kind of blurry and boring and safe, and that you need something like uh, an adversarial network or a reinforcement learning to force models to generate away from the mean and do something more interesting. So we had an idea um, led by Anna Huang, who uh, was a Google Brain intern working with, with me and the Magenta team, to say, can we, can we compose music using something similar? And this wasn't a one-to-one -one reuse of in-painting. The idea was that you would take multi-voice music, in this case Bach, and you would then remove voices. One, a voice is you know, sort of one melodic line, and there are four voices in this music. Um, we used Bach because the data was available and because, for some reason, AI music generation people obsess on Bach. So, so we did the same thing. And um, you can either remove part of the score as, as a chunk, or more interestingly, you can remove a voice at a time. So you remove one voice, and the other three voices are pr providing context. And then using Gibbs sampling, you sample in the missing bits. And then you remove another voice from the original data, and you sample in the missing bits and continue. And so you can do this really interesting conditional generation, conditioned by the uh, original data. Or you can um, simply um, start with something uh, empty and start to, to build voices one at a time. And it turns out the sampling helps a lot. So um, the first thing I'd like to do is just play this. Um, don't pay attention to the quality of the sound. It's just MIDI. Pay attention to the melody and see if you think there's anything there in what's been generated. So this would be the time to play the, the video. All right, so it's not perfect, but it's quite interesting. And what's interesting about it, the graph that I'm showing you is from, from our paper. Um, we, we compared the three different sampling routines to, to real Bach. And we found that when listeners were asked to rate the music, they actually preferred the um, Gibbs sampling to Bach himself, thus proving that we're better than Bach, right? Um, game over. No, what it shows, I think, is that these models capture something interesting. I think the way, we would, the way we put it in listening to them is, of course, it's not as good as Bach, but it captures almost some cartoonish aspects of Bach. It's almost like, it's almost like more Bach than Bach because it's simpler than Bach, but it captures some, some salient um, you know, Bach pieces. I'm also convinced if we had gone out to musical experts, not um, uh, standard side-by-sides, that we would have found something different. That said, we were happy to see that we had the kind of structure that people just didn't go, God, this is horrible, right? Um, so yeah, more Bach than Bach with, with, with very big quotes around either more or Bach or Bach. You take your pick. Okay, so now with what little time is left, let's move on to um, some image-based work. Um, also some work done in Brain with an intern, Vincent Dumoulin, uh, uh, some style transfer where we can do style transfer very quickly. We participated in Magenta in this project um, and actually put out on our GitHub um, some, I think, really nice uh, code for doing um, style transfer. Um, this was a tweet yesterday from Josh um, here at Google. Um, recommended Magenta style transfer code works out of the box with their Docker image. So I put that in as a plug to maybe get you people to try things out. I also think they're really beautiful images. They, it's a really nice... Um, use of multi-style transform or pastiche. Um, here's the obligatory video. I think, I believe we'll be at a point where we can do this um, in real time on, on device. I um, also would point out that because there's a nice latent space, you can move back and forth between styles and, um, and mix them and match them. Um, this is a, a Magenta team member's dog. Shout out to Peekaboo. However, I, I think the main reason, you know, we've all seen a lot of style transfer. Um, I want to point out that at least from from the viewpoint of Magenta, the style transfer work that's being done is, is extremely preliminary. I mean, first, it's really interesting. I think it's really cool that we can do this, that we can pull style from, from, from one network and, and then, via convolution, apply it to another. But to give you an example of where the challenges lay, um, we just have a kind of standard style transfer up above. And down below are four portraits by Picasso. And, and what I would argue from looking at portraits by an artist like this is that, you know, when artists are playing with geometry, when they're playing with sort of the, the deeper geometry of the human face or something else that has to do with deeper structure, it's clear that these convolutional patch-based, pixel-based models are, are, are lost. They, they simply can't do these kinds of transfers. 
And, and it turns out that st structure, whether it's structure in language to understand meaning across paragraphs, or structure in music, understanding phrases of music that, that span longer time scales, or structure in art, it all boils down to that, to this understanding of, of meaning at, at deeper and deeper layers. And I think that's where the sort of the grail is for us in, in terms of research. <clears throat> so why TensorFlow? Um, Magenta is a TensorFlow uh, GitHub. We are uh, GitHub slash TensorFlow slash Magenta. And um, we're dedicated to being, if you will, the glue between TensorFlow and the artistic community and the music community. Um, it has some real advantages for us. Um, the first one is because it's Python, we're able to work with everything. A lot of working with music and art has to do with just piping data around, be able to, being able to do the simple things. It's hard to see in the blue over there, but I just grabbed some of our HTTP archive um, dependencies, pretty MIDI and Mito are two big MIDI IO packages that we can just use immediately in, in Magenta, uh, thus in TensorFlow. Um, we have really fast and flexible image audio and video IO, um, which is crucial. A lot of our machine learning for even music becomes IO bound if we're learning from, say, 16 kilohertz audio. Um, it's just a lot of data to move around. We have TensorBoard. Like, if you're not using TensorBoard, you want to be using TensorBoard. Um, here's, here's a view of just some spectrograms from some audio generation stuff we're working on. It's so nice to be able to, while models are training, sample from them, look at, for us at their spectra, and listen to them, play with them without having to stop the model training while, while the model's working. And finally, there's the developer community. There's all of you. So the ability to, to build out a community of coders and uh, of artists and musicians that, um, that can, can work with us. What's next? Um, well, first, you could follow our blog at magenta.tensorflow.org. We use the blog to communicate the research that we're doing and to um, um, also um, highlight some code that we've written. Um, and also, please, just if you're, if you're a coder, and I, I guess everybody in this room is, this is a developer conference, give a, give a shot at trying out some things with Magenta. We're just sitting there at github tensorflow.magenta slash magenta, and uh, we have Docker install. We also have a pip install. Um, it's all pretty painless to use. So in closing, I want to leave you with this quote. Um, I won't have time to read it all, but there's this beautiful thing at the end. The excitement of grainy film of bleached out black and white is the excitement of witnessing events too momentous for the medium assigned to rec record them. I think the exciting part of, of, of Magenta is this idea of actually taking machine learning and its generative capacities and actually connecting it to people and allowing people to experience and work with this. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, the, the, uh, the opportunity to create something like a drum machine, but that actually has some intelligence to it, I think is, is compelling. Um, I want to thank you for your time. I also want to mention we will have a demo um, during drinks that is uh, an ability to play along on a piano keyboard with a, a magenta piano model. So that could be kind of fun. Stop by. I'll, be, I'll have a beer in my hand, and, and we can look at that together. And then I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Lily, who's going to talk about TensorFlow and uh, analyzing retinal images to diagnose causes of blindness. Thank you very much for your attention. Cheers. Thank you.